Good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen uh, from Johannesburg, South Africa, and good afternoon to participants in China. Uh, welcome to this collaborative webinar between China and uh, South Africa. I am Bhutle a researcher in the Pyrometallurgy Division at Mintech, and I will be chairing today's webinar. Thanks to all the attendees from all over the world uh, for joining in. The Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy and the China University of Mining Technology, often referred to as the CUMT, are proud to announce the first collaborative event between South Africa and China on the rock bus. Uh, this webinar includes uh, presentations uh, from global experts and revolves around the latest research and best practices. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce today's uh, speakers. Uh, we have two presentations. Uh, and uh, the first presentation will be presented uh, by professors from uh, CUMT. Uh, the first speaker will be Professor Alicia Ma, uh, the Vice Dean in the School of Mines at CUMT. From September 1997 to December 2007, he completed his undergraduate, master's and doctoral studies at CUMT, achieving a few awards and scholarships during this time. He was associate professor in 2009, doctoral supervisor in 2010, and professor in 2012. From 2011 to 2012, he studied tunnel and underground engineering in Tongji University. And from 2015 to 2016, he studied geological sciences and rock mechanics in G3 laboratory, in which is geomechanics, geofluids, and geohazards at the Pennsylvania State University. His main research work is water conservation, mining, and ground control. He has obtained more than 30 domestic authorized invention patents as the first right holder, and more than 10 foreign authorized invention patents. He has published three academic monographs and edited two textbooks. He has published more than 30 papers in SCI and more than 50 papers in EI, as the first author or corresponding author. He has directed the completed or uncompleted projects of National Natural Science Foundation of China, the new Century Excellent Tales, Talents, a project of Ministry of Education and sub-projects of advantageous disciplines in Jiangsu province. He completed the 863 and 973 programs and other projects as the research backbone. And he was responsible for more than 50 joint scientific and technological projects. He has won numerous awards in his career. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, that brings me to the title of the, of the first presentation of this webinar. It is entitled, A Possible Method to Predict uh, Rock Busts Using Infrared Radiation. And ladies and gentlemen, kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. And please ask your questions under the Q&A tab at the bottom. This will be addressed at the end of the second presentation. And uh, before I hand over to the professors, I also, to the professor, I would also like to mention then uh, the second uh, professor from uh, CUMT, uh, that is uh, Professor Hu Tsai. He is a distinguished professor of Jingsu province at CUMT and visiting research of Earth science and engineering at Imperial College London with expertise and experience in geomechanical, microseismic monitoring, and mining engineering. His core research of expertise are in the areas of mining engineering related to fault reactivation and its associated, associated acoustic emission or microseismic responses to rock burst and coal and gas outburst and fluid injection in geoseismicity in geothermal production. He has over 40 academic publications in refereed journals and conference proceedings. He received his PhD in mining engineering from CUMT. After joining CUMT in 2015, he succeeded in securing and performing the National and Natural Science Foundation of China project, which focuses on experimental study on microseismic precursors of fault reactivation induced by coal mining activities and the key state uh, research development program of China project, which focuses on research 
and development on remote monitoring and warning system of coal and robust hazards. He also supervised students and researchers to help with experiments and numerical modeling. And since joining Imperial College London as a research associate in 2017, he has been involved in several EU funded research projects. So uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, before I hand over to, uh, to Professor Ma, I would like uh, to hand over to Mr. Gofeng Wang to say a few words. Uh, thanks. Colleagues from the money industry. <laughs> Mr. Wang, you're on mute. Uh, if you could maybe say a few words uh, from, uh, from the CUMT side before we hand over to uh, Professor Ma. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear, lady, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, our fellow colleagues from the mining country from both South Africa and China, I am Bo Feng Wang. I'm from School of Mines, China University of Mining and Technology. Mr. Wang, are you, you are still on mute? I'm still mute. No, briefly, I can hear Mr. Uh, Mr. Wang. Can uh, if someone else just confirm that they can hear Mr. Wang? Or maybe then I will hand over directly to Professor Ma. So, Professor Ma, you are more than welcome uh, uh, to say a few words. Yes, we and can also hear start him. sharing your screen. Uh, thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Camilla, can you hear us now? I'm with Professor Ma. Yes, we can hear you. Can you just hold on one second? I just want to confirm. Bootley, can you hear me? Bootley, you're on mute if you're trying to talk. I think Bucha can't hear anyone, Camilla. Okay. Um, Mr. Wang, you can carry on, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Camilla, can you see it now? Our presentation. Yes, you can yes, see your yes. presentation. Yes, okay. Professor. You can go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Meng Yi Chiang from School of Mines, China University of Mining and Technology. Today, I want to give a short presentation about a possible method to predict the rock was using infrared radiation that we researched in recent years, my team. Firstly, I will give a brief introduction of CMT. China University of Mining and Technology, CMT, is located in Shizhou, in the city of Shizhou, in Jiangsu province, which has a population around 10 million. Shizhou is three hours from Beijing and Shanghai, a high speed train. Uh, which are about uh, 300 kilometers uh, hour. There are over 30,000 students at CUMT. The School of Mines has over 145 academic research staff and more than 2,000 students. It has six departments, mining engineering, industry engineering, traffic and transportation, new energy science and engineering, open pit mining engineering, resource and engineering. Now we will go to the use of infrared radiation, in short for RR. RR is useful in rock failure research because the equipment is reliable, simple, and measures an area rather than a power source. So it's more likely to counter changes in rock surface under stress during the school, uh, which has uh, six uh, parts. Uh, first uh, is a new thermal noise correction approach. Second uh, is characteristics of the internal RR flow. Third is RR quantitative characterization of damage. And the next is a spiral 
chiral RR precursors on aphelias or phyllis. Next is what in rush precursors by RR. The last is IR intelligent monetary system, which is our uh, latest uh, research in, in last uh, about 10 years. First, uh, we will come to the come to a new background thermal noise correction approach. The influence of background thermal noise on the infrared radiation temperature is uh, always uh, annoying us, which uh, in, uh, during this experiment, uh, which we can see the loading, the loading somehow has the same change about the infrared temperature with the unloading samples. So uh, the same experiment group was similar Christ during the loading stage. So the background of the monoids in short form became significantly obscured the real change of the effective signal of the R, marking BTM correction necessary. We use a RRTPTM correction model like this. The signal to noise vision of RT can be improved from the mean value of 104 to 60, uh, 70 to 69 on average, which has improved greatly. The accuracy of monetary rock fracture by RR thermal energy is improved. Now we come to characteristics of internal uh, rock internal temperature theory loading has a positive relationship with time and loading. Uh, greater than 0.92. The RT of SAS2 shows an increase, uh, increase. On average, it is 0.23 degree. This is our test sample. Third so is RR quantitative characterization of rock damage. RR counting, uh, that is the number of draft elements in infrared temperature metrics. The RRC links damage intensity and the corresponding infrared radiation temperature, uh, which, means, uh, uh, which means the RC links damage, which will change the graphs, uh, which the RC uh, has means uh, some uh, because of uh, some change. The RC and the AE ranging counting have the features of simultaneous, simultaneous and the sudden change. Uh, this is a uh, RR counting change. This is AE rating counting, which has a simultaneous and sudden change. So uh, from this uh, phenomenon, uh, we use the constitutive model of damage as follows. Uh, in this formulation, M and uh, A are the parameters obtained by fitting the RR damage. So the sigma RR can reflect the failure process of rock transition from linear elastic to plastic deformation stage. Like this. Uh, this, uh, this is very well. Now, uh, we will talk about the special temporal uh, precursors, several index, huge index about precursors. First is uh, variables of successive minus uh, uh, temperature, in short for VSMRT. This is the new index. The definition of VSMRT is formed. From the VSMRT, we get two precursors. First is initial failure, in short for TRF. TRF of VSMRT was 26.6 times of the mean amplitude before the sudden change. Yeah, that's it. And another precursor of upcoming failure, in short for TUF. TUF of VSMRT was more than 280 times of the mean amplitude before the sudden change. So from, this is a stress time curve and the VS MRT time curve. So we can get a, 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 a precursor 
about the ZTE. From the VSMRT, we get the precursor time uh, because this is a VSMRT and time curve. Uh, we get the time, and then we can, from the time, we can, we can get the uh, location. We can know when the image, infrared image, will appear the sudden change. So we get the we get the special temporary RR precursors. Uh, infrared radiation B value, that's the precursor. BRR in short for BR value. Uh, we know that uh, B value is famous in AE, but uh, in the infrared radiation, we find the B value is used, uh, is find the B value too. That is the B value is used in acoustic AE, uh, acoustic emission AE, uh, initially in sensing neurological applications. We introduce the same parameter for RR. A significant um, sudden change of BR value can be observed. Uh, we can find the uh, 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 value, uh, uh, BR value. The main amplitude of the first sudden change was uh, more than 15 times of the main amplitude before the sudden change. Another index is high temperature parameter scaling factor, in short for HTPSE. The ART rate change before and after rook dilatancy, ART change rate of rook signal is this. High temperature, that means HTPSE, it can identify the time of rook dilatancy to predict rook field. That means uh, in the RR information, we can find this dilatancy point and which can be used to predict the Another indicator is the energy dissipation infrared radiation ratio, we shall call EDRR. The inflation point of rook uh, EDRR from horizontal to rapid growth can be regarded as a precursor point for rook failure. Uh, this does not only solve the problem of characterizing the total stream energy and the elastic stream energy of rook. But also facilities the monitoring in the early morning rock failure by combining uh, with this uh, internal uh, status. Uh, for the cyclical uh, loading, that uh, load and unload response ratio, and you are based on RRT rates. The rock somehow in the initial stage of cyclical loading and unloading shows a downward trend of ERRT, and after that, that shows an upward trend for loading and a downward trend for unloading. The LUR based on RTR sudden increase in value occurred in the last cycle, just before the end. So it's a very, it's a good uh, indicator uh, precursor to break. Good precursor indicator. It can be used as a precursor of the uh, in million rock failure. Uh, now we use the, the precursors in what's in rush. That means that what what is in rush precursors by R. Uh, this is our experiment setup uh, in the laboratory. Uh, before what's in rush, the thermal ground, the temperature distribution is uniform. It's uniform. ARRT is a horizontal fluctuation. VSMRT is has no significant change. But um, when the rock approaching the water rush, the thermal gram shows high temperatures of anomaly. And the ART drops sharp. And the VSM is significantly sudden change. Uh, this is the uh, figure it shows uh, three, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this two indicates uh, change the sudden. This is uh, our laboratory setup. And uh, at the last, uh, we created an um, RR intelligent monitor system. Uh, the two frame vibrational neural network answer algorithm based on differential infrared imaging was proposed. We build a software VR. Software VR, we can use it as uh, intelligent, intelligent extraction model 
for abnormal features of gene for red death was established. The intelligent RR monitor system and the portable RR monitor equipment was developed. Uh, discussion. The problem of information distortion during the RR observation of loading rule is solved through RRT. That means the background thermal noise correction model. The scientific problem that the characteristic Resize the internal damage of rope by the surface gene for radiation information was broke through using the R damage factor, uh, which means uh, in the past we all think that the R information just shows the surface uh, status, but uh, now we can see that uh, R information can uh, can show the internal status damage status of the rope during loading. The abnormal of the DRR value, that is the D value, and other indicates in all tests occur before violent failure of the uh, brittle rook sample, especially for hard rook. In all the tests, the warning time varied between 11 seconds to 46.9 seconds, which is relatively short, but could be enough to get personal uh, safety distance from the impending violent uh, failure. So it's an uh, imminent uh, precursor, it's uh, has, uh, is meaningful. And obviously, more research and testing is uh, required, but the method shows potential. Uh, we future uh, research. Our future research will focus on the following. Additional lambda test uh, using drug sample under different stress tensors especially on the money-induced stress to obtain a more thorough understanding of the potential. Large-scale lab tests using simulated excavations to obtain more realistic results, and then it's um, more like uh, the, uh, the actual money-induced stress. Development of uh, man was the equipment suit. Uh, in fact, we have drawn the as a factory in infrared radiation camera factory to build this is the other way. And the inside test, in fact, we have some inside test uh, now. On behalf of the School of Mines, CMT, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present at this joint webinar. We look forward to further cooperation, moving forward to address many issues of mutual interest. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, the questions, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, post your questions under the Q&A tab, and the questions will be answered at the end of the second presentation. So thanks again, uh, Professor, for that uh, highly educational talk. And apologies at the beginning, I had uh, shortcomings, I had some challenges with my, with my audio. So big apologies from my side. Uh, the next talk uh, will be presented by Professor Lindsay Linza. Uh, she is a corporate consultant and associate partner at SRK with 25 years of combined experience in the processing and interpretation of seismic waves, ranging from acoustic emissions recorded in the laboratory, seismic surveys for geotechnical purposes, seismicity induced by shallow and deep level mining, and seismic reflection data. She was recently appointed as an honorary professor of seismic wave field simulation at the University of Evert-Batesrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. She has applied a state-of-the-art seismic interpretation technology to extract information vital to shaft sinking, optimal borehole setting, and mine planning. She has specialist skills in determining seismic source mechanisms, so the laboratory tests in the rock and concrete and mining seismology. At the moment, a tensor invasion using her own code and expertise in dynamic numerical modeling. So that's 2D and 3D of seismic waves for AE and NDT laboratory tests and mine seismology problems, geotechnical problems, shaft sinking, and reflection seismology. Lindsay is an expert user and programmer in, in 
MX Rep, a geotechnical data analysis and monitoring platform within which data analysis tools have been developed under the ACGs, Mine Seismic City and Robust Risk Management Project. She is the recipient of a number of awards, the most prestigious of which are the Roca Medal in 2003, awarded by the International Society for Rock Mechanics, awarded for an outstanding doctoral thesis entitled A Relative Moment Tensor Inven Inversion Technique Applied to Seismicity in Use by Mining, and the Salmon Award awarded in 2007 by the South African Institute of Rock Engineering for her paper, A Hybrid Relative Moment Tensor Methodology, published in the RA Assignment 5, which is Rock Bus and Seismicity in Mines are Proceedings. And recently, she was awarded the Saim Gold Medal for her paper to stop contribute to Seismic Source an impressive CV, I must say. Uh, the title of Prof. Linza's talk is 3D Dynamic Modeling in the Underground Mine Environment. Over to you, Professor Linza. Thanks. Hi, that came as a bit of a surprise. I thought I was talking last. Um, so um, I didn't expect to have this particular time, time slot. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, we can see your screen and we okay. can hear you nice. Thanks. Fantastic. So I'm going to be giving a summary of recent dynamic modeling in the underground environment. Um, it's stuff that we've been working on for, for many years and now we finally come of age and we're able to actually model these very big mining geometries in 3D and then compare the waveforms to, to, to our uh, modeled waveforms. This is work done by Lucy Crocker, one of my students, and I was grinning like a fool the whole way through her and um, her work. She didn't actually know what was wrong with me, but I was just so pleased to actually be at the stage where we can finally start doing something really useful with it. So everybody who's worked in mining seismology knows that there are some very big differences between mining seismology and crustal seismology. So even though most of our um, maths and physics models are based on the crustal seismology models, there's some very big differences. So I've I've grouped them into three here. First of all, the skin effects, and those will be things like reflection, refraction, interference, surface waves, and our site effects. And these will affect the peak particle velocities on the skin of the excavation. And those in turn affect our calculations for support demand and seismic hazard. Then we've got the ray path effects. So that's what happens to the waveform when it travels from the source to the um, site. And you get scattering, diffraction, reflection, all of those things, shear wave splitting and they affect the source parameters. Um, in particular, the moment tensor, you start seeing false components, which actually aren't reflective of your true source. Then the mining geometry, this is work that has come by fairly recently. Um, seismologists have definitely noted that there are effects of mining geometry on observations, but they haven't really been quantified until now. So we've got two, two recent papers on this, the elastic response of uh, the stope causing a complex wave field, and then there's also work on um, how the, the shapes of the tunnels and the sizes of, um, of them and how they re uh, relate to the wavelength can lead to, to resonance and amplification. This also affects our source parameters and the seismic hazard. So I'm going to take you through previous studies um, that have been that are useful because they're connected to the current work, then introduce you to Wave 3D. Now Wave 3D has been, um, been around for a very long time, um, at least 30 years. But it isn't very, it isn't reported on in the literature very well. So I'm hoping just to make you I'm aware of this. Um, I'm going to compare it to some physical models um, and then look into some further um, work that's been published. And then two very quick case studies. The one is very relevant to our rock burst problem because it's a um, it's an underground um, case study. And the second one is um, I've got some very cool videos, which is why I wanted to really show it, but it just shows how how we can model linear blast sources. Um, underground or on the surface in things like um, open pits. So first of all, just a bit of the background stuff. Now this is work that was done by Alex Milev um, in 1999 and a, and a team at CSR Mining Tech. It's an old slide, but I've put it up because I found some recent work published in 2022, which is actually working, has, has actually re-looked at this, uh, this data in a different way. So I found that very interesting. So for the guys who haven't seen this before, what we're looking at, um, the, 
the um, the 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 dark blue triangles are the um, peak particle velocities recorded by um, the in-mine seismic system. So they were geophones that were drilled in about 10 to 15 meters into the solid rock. And then for this, uh, that same event has also recorded the, um, the peak particle velocity on the skin of the excavation. So that's all of the, the peak. We had an instrument called a ground motion monitor. Um, so you can see that even though um, it's, it's recording the same event, there's a huge difference in the um, the, the amplitudes of these um, seismograms. And we get some, sometimes up to about 10 times the amplification. Um, on average, they worked out that, that they had about five to six times amplification caused by the skin of the excavation. So just keep, keep that side in mind when we, um, for, um, for later. This is work done by Mark Hildert, um, showing it, to show you that he was doing 3D modeling in 2001 when our computers really were nothing compared to what we've got, got now. And um, the nice thing about modeling is you can compare um, your, your actual model to a theoretical model where um, you actually haven't mined before. So we've got a stoke model compared to the solid model. Um, and what he's done is he's um, got a magnitude 1.3 event in, in the foot wall, and he's, um, he's, he's, he's made that shear. It's generated a um, seismic waves that's then propagated right down the actual the lead lag face. And there's amplification because of the wave geometry and because of surface waves. So the peak particle velocities recorded over there in the pillar are something like six times those of the solid model. So it's a very good way to actually isolate your, your stoke effect. This is um, work done in 2015 by Wang and Kai. Um, we're using a code called spec, spec FEM 2D. And they were looking at the wavelength to expression span. It's very interesting work. Um, I'd actually just come back from consulting for 10 years. So this was the first time I, I'd seen um, work in this field where they were taking our initial work a whole lot further. So I was, I was very excited. Um, and it concluded that the wavelength to tunnel, ra tunnel width ra ratio had a very significant influence on the ground motions and the PPV. Then Rafaldi in 2017 took this a little bit further and he was using UDEC and used a plain uh, wave source um, and looking, also looking at the wavelength to excavation um, span, the ratio on the PPV amplification. So he's plotted the amplification on the um, vertical axis versus frequency. And you can see that there's a peak at about 150 Hertz saying that there's a maximum amplification of over 2.5 happening at, at that frequency. So I found that very interesting too. Once again, it's in, in 2D. Then this is the recent paper that I, I was talking about um, by Wang and um, a number of other co-authors co from 2022 also spec FEM 2D, and they were modeling the amplification in the near field motion in a tunnel area, and they um, broke down their, their um, analyses into four different effects. So they looked at the main um, seismic source wavelength, the tunnel span, tunnel shape, and the range at a range of damage zones. So that'll be the fracture zone um, around the tunnel. And they derived an empirical equation. So you can see the equation at the bottom here. It's a product of a whole lot of different factors. Um, the tunnel span factor, tunnel shape factor, excavation damage factor, and the maximum amplification factor. Um, two of them are empirical equations where, where, where they're doing curve fits, and then the other two are um, sort of weightings um, that, that they've determined from the modeling according to the, the shape of the tunnel and the level of the, the, um, the damage. So um, that very first slide that I show you, showed you, it was data from this project in Orange here. It was a SIMRAC project. And the study areas were East Dree, Tartona, Puning, and Cliff and Harmony. And what these guys did um, was they used their model, their empirical model, to work out a best fit of the amplification, which is this column here. And they compared that to the amplification that was actually reported in the literature. And they managed to get them very close. The one thing that worries me a bit about this paper is that this D value, which is your tunnel span, and um, these numbers look very big for tunnels. Um, they, I, I can't remember enough about that study. Um, I, I can't remember where those ground motion monitors were actually placed. Um, they could have been in stopes, but we actually, as South Africans, need to revisit this, uh, this work and just see what the real values of this D factor are. Okay, getting to WAVE. Um, WAVE 3D, it was initially, the core of it was written by Peter Kundal. He's the guy who wrote, he's written all of the Itasca codes like PFC 
and FLAC and all of the very famous ones that are used worldwide. John Napier um, took it on for a bit and then Mark Hildred has done the main work on it. Um, Mark is now based at Leeds University and he's still developing um, WAVE. It, it runs in either a little um, command line box in Windows or on Linux if you've got access to, to a cluster. Um, it's a 3D dynamic code, finite difference method, fourth order um, partial differentials. And it's very, very, very efficient due to its orthogonal staggered grid, which is why Mark was able to do those, um, very, um, those 3D models in 2001. It's got this unique ability to model the effect of voids because that's what it was designed for. It was designed for the deep level uh, mining environment. Um, you can model your near, intermediate and far field. And um, he's been gradually extending the capability to model a whole lot of different sources. Um, so from your point source, finite fault sources, and recently the moment tensor sources, um, and linear sources, of course. And you can spec uh, specify a rupture uh, velocity to actually propagate along your um, either your, your linear source or your, um, your fault plane. Um, you can represent fractures explicitly. So usually fractures are just um, implemented by introducing um, a, a Q value or something. But here you actually are ex explicitly introducing them into to the model. Um, then, of course, you can record whatever you like, displacement, velocity, stress in different directions, etc., etc. It's been optimized for um, cluster computing on, um, on Linux, so you can run really huge models if you want to. And he's got these um, perfectly matched boundaries to um, absorb the waveform so that they don't bounce off the edges of the um, model. So this is also quite a famous picture by Arno Denker, um, where he was comparing his physical model to a 2D wave model. So what he's got here are these cubes of plexiglass, which are biorefringent when you apply a stress field to them. So that means that under the right conditions, you can actually photograph the um, stress waves. So this is a, um, a 2D slice. He's got a, um, a stope, which is just a slot in his, his model, and then a whole lot of fractures. And he's detonated a high velocity explosive. I think he did it probably on this side of the uh, model, um, that then propagated, and he was able to model it extremely well in um, 2D, which is actually the, it's the most amazing picture this because it's capturing most of the elements of what she's um, photographing in, um, in the actual phys physical model. Here's another one, and you can see the similarities in the shapes of the wave propagation. Really quite, quite extraordinary work. Um, then um, I do a lot of um, co-supervision of, um, of students with Mark at um, Leeds University. So I've been getting them to follow up on these papers that have been published and to do match modeling, to take these models into 3D. So the first one that we looked at, um, the student's name was Cameron McKenzie in 2017. He did match modeling to investigate the Rifoldi um, findings, which was just to remind you this little graph here where we had the peak at 150 hertz, with the peak amplification of 2.5 times. So the key difference is that we're incorporating the third dimension here. Um, so the waves can now spread in 3D, not just be trapped in a 2D plane. Um, here are the results of the match modeling, and you can see that we got, so he's got the same graph as Rifoldi, um, but Rifoldi, there's Rifoldi's peak at 150 hertz, and you can see with the 3D modeling, it peaks there, but it's very, very, very slight. It's not nearly as severe as it was in 2D. So there was much less of a um, correlation. Uh, this shows you why. I've got a model here where I've done the same model in 2D and 3D, and then recorded um, so we've got a finite source that we've made slip and then a little array of five geophones just some bit away from, from the source. There they are again in, I mean, in 3D and then we, we recorded the velocities in the y direction. And you can see that um, the close ones are quite big and the further ones they, um, they decay. But when you compare the 3D model to the 2D model, you'll see that the decay in 2D is actually too slow. So what happens with 2D models is, is that you get um, an over-representation of your, um, your wave displacements and velocity, so you get overly conservative models. This is why it's very important with these kind of studies to do it in 3D. And in this case here, our fantastic um, uh, trend that Foldy noticed almost disappears because of actually modeling in a 3D space. Um, he had some work done by uh, Mark Hilde and Han Wesseler and I, where um, it's fairly recent work published in the Journal of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, 
we modeled a stoop, so that area there, with five pillars in the middle, and we had a shearing source down the side of the um, uh, one pillar, modeled bird crushing and shearing sources. Um, it was quite a big model, so we ran it on the Leeds cluster. The reason for the big model was we had to be in the far field of the, the pillars as well as the, uh, the stoop itself. So we had to be um, very far away from it, so we needed a very big block to actually simulate the stoop there. Sources. So we had um, four crush sources and four um, shearing sources where we first had a control case. So your crush and your shear source in, in, in solid. And then we introduced the stope and then introduced the pillars. So we were able to isolate each one of the, those effects. So you see here, I've got um, comparing the solid model to the model with the stope for the crushing source on the left hand side and the shearing source on the right hand side. We've got textbook um, equations here for a shearing source for the solid model, small P waves, very big S waves. And then in the case of the, um, well, slightly bigger P waves here, in the case of the shearing source, we've got very big um, S waves. Um, as soon as we introduce that stop, then you're starting to get the secondary response, which is caused by our stop. And here you see it again with the shearing source. Um, this is now the, the model with the stiff and the soft pillars, and we're seeing that stoop response again over there. So this is very interesting because the stoop itself is actually behaving like a secondary source. So what's happening is we're getting shearing on that fault and then full fault over there, and then it, it's actually causing an elastic response of the stoop, which is then generating um, seismic waves. And of course, they're all superimposed. So, and our geophones don't know where, where the waves are coming from. So the geophones are just recording everything that it gets. So they're getting both the combined, the combined um, response of the stoop and your um, shearing source. So if you look at the waveforms, um, the top is the crash source, the bottom is the shearing source. That is the solid model on the far left-hand side. We've got strong shear waves for the shearing source, and then we've got uh, P waves and shearing waves for the um, crushing source. As soon as we introduce the stope, you get diffractions on the edges. Um, and you can see here, we had a finite source and we actually um, propagated the rupture downwards. So we get a Doppler effect where we get compression of the frequencies in front of the, the rupture and the dilatation further away. Um, and all of this extra energy here in the middle is because of actually having stopes. And there again. So because it's modeling, we can actually work what our input um, uh, moments are. We can separately work out the moment of the crushing source as well as the, um, the, the moment of the pillar. And then we can compare those to the um, moment that we calculate from, from the size grams. And in both cases, as soon as you add a stope to your models, then there's a contribution of the stope that dominates the seismic moment. So instead of our seismic moment being 1.6 um, uh, tension line newton meters, it's going to be round about 12. That's a whole lot bigger. And that's because of the contribu contribution because of the stoke. And the same thing happens with our sharing source. In the model with just a sharing source um, in, in, in solid, it's 5.2 and it goes up to about um, 12, 13. Now the moment tensor, um, I've just, just got the sharing model here. Um, so the solid model with, with, with no source is always to have a perfect moment tensor double couple source. And if you plot your uh, theoretical moments versus the um, actual input moments, you get a nice correlation. As soon as you add your, your stoop, then there's a whole lot of um, these other extra wave effects and different contributions, which then causes a huge amount of, um, of scatter in your input data, and we get much poorer moment into solutions. Um, there's also the effect on the, the peak particle velocity. So we've got the case with the shear just for the shear source with no stope and with a stope, and you'll see that the red is the case with the stope and the PPVs are a whole lot higher. I won't go through that. Now let's go to the fun part, the case studies. This is the work done by Lucy um, Crocker. She was very interested in working out a kind of correction for the peak particle um, um, velocities, and that correction would be basically caused, the amplification caused by our mining geometries. So we had the Tasmanian database from a mine called Beaconsfield, which is an, an open database. It's um, a complete database of seismograms, um, as well as the mining geometries, all of the different mining steps, and a catalog of processed events. And she looked at magnitude 1.9, 
um, that had been published in the liter literature. So she, uh, we had a theoretical moment tensor, and then we modeled that as a source in um, WAVE. Here I have um, actually used her model to generate some different um, images. Uh, this is two different uh, time, time steps for our model with the moment tensor source and the mining geometry at an early time step, and then you can see with um, at, at a much later time step when the wave field has propagated outwards. Here you can see I've, I'm comparing it to the solid model. So the top is a solid model where we have our cloverleaf pattern, which is what we expect for a radiation pattern from a shearing source. Um, and as soon as you introduce the voids to the model, you get a much more asymmetrical um, cloverleaf pattern. You can see it's actually wrapping around there. The diffractions are moving around. And it definitely doesn't look like that source. Now, all of our calculations are based on this as a theoretical model. But in actual fact, when we're dealing with mining seismology, we're dealing with radiation patterns which have been rather messed up. So some just looking at um, the effect of the excavations, um, one effect is we get a very strong surface wave that goes propagating up, um, up, up along the skin of the excavation. Then I've taken the mining geometry away so you can look inside the excavation and you'll see that it's very red there. And that's actually not real. This is because of our pseudo air approximation. Um, Mark hasn't introduced a null command in, into WAVE yet. So we have to use a very soft material um, inside the scopes to simulate the air. Um, it's still got to be elastic. So um, we've used a very low density, very high low velocity material, which of course um, will actually displace um, with very large displacement, which is why we've got this whole this red zone in the middle. So that's just an artificial effect of the very soft material inside the um, excavations. Then um, Lucy compared the modeled waveforms to the real ones. I'll first just show you the solid model versus the model with the voids, um, the modeling, looking at um, events, uh, the uh, geophone on the same side as the event, which was over there, quite a close one. The model um, on the top, X, Y, and Z. And as soon as you start introducing the, the voids, um, you get this extra effect here. This is very, very, very interesting because it's actually, the, the arrivals are earlier. You can see there's no arrival over, over there. They actually are earlier than um, that in the solid model. So that I think is showing how the radiation pattern has kind of swung around and we're getting a, basically the shape of the radiation pattern is starting to, to affect where we're getting um, the, um, the amplitudes. I, I need to invest investigate this further because this is actually quite an unexpected thing. I actually thought that we'd get more of a solid model type of look because you know the ray paths are are quite straight but clearly we, we're still seeing we're actually seeing the effect of the um the excavations there here's a, a geophone on the other side of the uh, mining geometry and there's a change in polarity of our model with the voids and also a delay because that that wave is actually diffracting around the whole um mining geometry so that's quite a market um, effect here, this is a slide that made me extremely thrilled because it's actually we at a stage now where we can start comparing the model data to the recorded data. So we've got recorded data, you can see it's a whole lot higher frequency. Um, if I'd filtered it, it probably would look a bit more similar to all of this, but I just left it in to show all of the detail. And it's quite amazing because we're capturing um, a lot of these very fascinating um, wave shapes, like this little thing in the, the, the very beginning, and then that uh, Prof, we have lost you there. Prof, we have lost your audio. Oh, can you see that? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Great. Um, I just had a little internet glitch. Um, okay, so this is, um, I was just saying, the most exciting um, slide of the entire talk. For me, anyway, it's not the most glamorous, but we actually are recording our real data to uh, compare the model data. This is now a, another geophone. We had a very nice match over there but less of a match over here and the frequency is actually very low. So clearly there's a lot more work that needs to, to get done here. 
Now, this was some very fun stuff that I did for, it was a combination of open pit mining, where we had an underground mine below the open pit, and they wanted to blast the crown pillar between the open pit and underground mine. But they didn't want to destroy the underground excavations, because we actually wanted to blast all of the um, rock into the, um, the excavations, so it could be mined from below. So we designed the um, source to mine the, to mimic the real physics of the blast. So we're propagating the, um, the wave along a linear source from the bottom to the top. Um, and you can see the shape of that, um, and that, that, that wave cone. And we've scaled it so that your PPV scales with the length of the charge, which is what happens in, um, in reality. Um, the PPV also depends on your velocity of detonation of your explosives because um, you get lots of different um, explosive types. So we've got, here's our um, mining geometry below the, um, the open pit and the surface of the open pit. We're just focusing on that little area over there. And I was actually modeling a very complicated pattern of a triple deck system. This is only showing one of the decks, but there, there's actually there are two more layers and then they detonate in quite a complicated um, sequence. So here we've got a horizontal slice through the geometry and, you, uh, and what I've done is I've shown you the maximum peak particle velocity that's recorded for the entire duration of the model. So um, this is basically maximum PPV. Um, and you can see that it's concentrated on the skin of the excavations, which is what we would expect as is well in the very kind of closed tunnels. Um, this is a, a vertical slice. There's our blasting array, and you can see that the velocity is a whole lot higher, going up to almost two meters per second. Um, and then we've got the um, amplification down, down the side walls. And then I've got two um, movies, which I want to show you. They're very quick. Um, PowerPoint didn't let me put them into the presentation, so I'm just going to play them. Wesley added some sound for me. <laughs> the first time I heard this, I got quite a fright. So the, the blasting goes on for about two seconds, but you can see that. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through it slowly so you can have a look. Lindsay, sorry, we can't see the uh, the, the, the uh, video oh, no. that showing. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, so if you share. want me to share it. Um, yes, please, Camilla, please. Which one, which one is it? Is it um, um, do the longitudinal one, please. I'll stop sharing. I've got a new laptop and I'm having all sorts of problems. It's a very fancy one, but I can't do some simple things at the moment. Not the real soundtrack, it's a soundtrack that we found on online, but we just thought it was fun. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Camilla. And if you could play the next one, uh, the next one is a different slice. So it's just a, a slightly different view of that um, mining geometry. We calibrated all of these uh, these models, and um, the PPVs actually matched the uh, measured data very, very, very nicely. So it was a fantastic project. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Uh, Linza. Does that conclude your yes, presentation? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, thanks a million times. I particularly enjoyed uh, your case studies. Uh, so uh, now I'll go through the q and A. I I see so far there are only two questions under Q&A. And uh, the first question is by Wu Tsai. It's for uh, the team from, uh, from the CM, CUMT. So it seems like the IR emission simultaneously followed with a series of stress drops. Can we correlate the IR emissions with stress drops rather than continuous stress? So that is for you, Professor Ma.
Uh, uh, Professor Ma, we cannot hear you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wang, we can't hear any, we can't hear anything from your end. I give a short uh, answer. Uh, in fact, uh, dual laser is a uh, pavement uh, stage. Uh, our rock uh, surface uh, RR information uh, is controlled by the stress. Uh, and uh, it, it is affected by the rock status. When the rock is, uh, has the correct, uh, the internal correct, uh, it, it's a stress, uh, a stress will change. So, uh, so, so which are uh, the which uh, which the I emission simultaneous? Uh, in fact, it's formed with a uh, uh, stress, a series of stress uh, drops uh, at the same time. So, um, it has a career relationship between the uh, emission and the stress drop, but. Uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, stage, uh, we will notice uh, and pay attention to that. Uh, that uh, make it uh, drop dramatically uh, and uh, see the uh, see the new RR information change. Thank you. Is the first uh, question. Uh, the second, uh, the second, I can see. Thank you, Professor. So then this, I'll just read out uh, the second question for completeness. Again, is uh, for the CMUT uh, team. So there is from Jack, a uh, very interesting work by CMUT, especially for the intact rock failure, like pillars. Has any IR emission work been done in samples where a pre-existing structure is present? And if so, is the, are the findings the same? And the question, is it expected that the IR emissions be used on the various sources, i.e. on shear, sleep, crash, for possible prediction? Over to you, Prof. Prof. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, we have done some experiments uh, that uh, with the samples uh, uh, pre-existing structure, like uh, the like the uh, mummy uh, cracks uh, in the sample. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this, uh, today we have not shown, because uh, we have not shown these uh, uh, results. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when we pre existing the cracks uh, in the sample, uh, which has some, which has some uh, for example, uh, along the with some interesting results, for example, along the along the correct surface, um, uh, the temperature uh, will become high uh, than other uh, other parts because uh, the pre uh, because the rock rock will uh, will move uh, when it's broken. Uh, it's uh, broken along this pre. Uh, uh, exist uh, uh, crack, cracks, so uh, we can see the obvious uh, change along the cracks. And uh, and then, uh, for example, shear slip and other cr crash. That uh, I think that the friction, uh, the friction uh, makes the temperature high. Um, it's interesting. And uh, 
Not only uh, have chance uh, with the uh, shows some fundings uh, uh, with uh, somehow like the pre-existing structures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for that comprehensive uh, answer. So uh, I don't see more questions under the Q and A tab, but I do have a question uh, for you, Professor Ma. It's uh, related to the School of Mines at CUMT. So uh, one of the earlier slides you showed us some of the mining labs. They are quite impressive. So the interest there is to find out uh, the funding. Uh, do you source most of your funding uh, in partnership with industry, or are you supported uh, mainly by government funding. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, some funding, uh, some funding from the uh, national. Uh, of course, uh, we is uh, is just uh, just from my uh, other other projects uh, funding uh, left uh, funding left. We. And collect the funding from other projects and from about 10 years ago. And from about five years ago, because we have do some achievements. So uh, the, uh, the National Foundation Center uh, gives uh, give us some uh, function support, uh, foundation support. And uh, the China University of Mining Technology uh, give us some uh, the foundation support. Now, um, uh, now last year, uh, the end of the last year, we get um, uh, we get a project uh, in in for, uh, in uh, from the uh, from uh, from the industry uh, from the uh, a comma from a comma in the comma industry, which about uh, uh, nearly um, fifty. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, half uh, half million, which are about uh, half million, uh, half million GST dollar uh, from the industry. Now, some uh, command support uh, that see the achievements and uh, that view is uh, uh, potential and uh, began uh, uh, began to support us. Thank you. Hi, hi there. Something to end. Actually, you asked the question is about the funding of uh, our school of mines lamps. Uh, we get this kind of funding from different sources. Uh, we, we can get from our central government. Every year we have uh, uh, dozens of uh, grants from our central government. This kind of funding is worth uh, tens of millions RMB. Also like uh, from the a provisional government, we can also get some funding. It's roughly also uh, dozens of millions of IMB. And uh, in the past year, 2021, our municipal government, uh, Xuzhou uh, City, the municipal government has uh, proposed to join the CMT to establish a land, uh, like a devoting in, in this civil engineering and mining engineering. This kind of uh, a project will last for several years. The all, all project will will um will be funded with uh, also uh, dozens of millions. Uh, IMB. Uh, according to our statistics in 2021, uh, only our school school of mines, our our single school, got funding uh, roughly. Uh, 200 millions uh, RMB uh, from uh, both uh, the governments and also our industrial partners. Uh, uh, coal mines, some metalliferous mines, uh, and some consulting companies. Yeah, th this is uh, the, the whole, 200 million, nearly 200 altogether. Uh, nearly 200 million uh, RMB uh, from the state, from the industry, from uh, all sorts of uh, Professor Ma confirmed that because Prof Professor Ma is our deputy dean of our school. Uh, he is in charge of the, the management uh, administration of this uh, scientific research at our school. So 
is he confirmed the figure is the over 200 millions of IMB. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nearly, yeah. Near, roughly, yeah. roughly 200 millions. Thank you. That's our answer. Thank you very much. That's that's very impressive. Many thanks. So uh, I don't see any further questions under the Q&A tab, but there's a comment uh, from Professor Utsai, a very interesting work from uh, Professor Lindsay Linzer, especially in PPV. So that brings me maybe to my questions uh, for Professor Linzer. So uh, Professor Linzer, uh, you did mention a few times that you collaborate with uh, Leeds uh, University. So my question is, do you also collaborate with universities elsewhere in the world other than Leeds? Could you say a few words al along those lines? Yeah. Uh, Professor Linz, I, I cannot hear, we cannot hear you. Okay, Professor Linza has unfortunately logged off. Um, so we'll address any questions to her um, after the, the webinar. Okay, many thanks, Camilla, for the clarity. So then maybe one very last question. Of course, I'm there's of course lots of interest uh, to collaborate between South Africa and China. So again, uh, Professor Ma and Professor Tsai, uh, one last question. I'm quite familiar with the landscape in Europe. I spent a bit of time in Europe uh, and I've seen uh, from, your, from your short bios that uh, Professor Ma, you have spent a bit of time at Pennsylvania State University in the US, and I've seen that Professor Tsai has also spent a bit of time at Imperial College London. So do you collaborate extensively with universities in other parts of the world? And maybe also here in South Africa, we of course have some big mining universities here locally as well in South Africa. So could you say a few words, uh, professors? Thanks. Uh, so, the professors, you are, you, are, you are mute. We cannot hear anything from your side. Thanks. Uh, yes, we, uh, we have some uh, stronger research uh, with other uh, universities in other countries, like uh, in Australia and America. And uh, and uh, coalition uh, of students. Hi, hi there. According to Professor Ma, at our school, not only we have this kind of uh, research cooperations with other universities uh, in, from uh, uh, America, from uh, Australia, and also some universities from uh, uh, from from Africa. Also, we have some kind of uh, uh, programs uh, to, to uh, jointly cultivate the students. Yeah. And uh, most specifically, that was uh, last semester, the second semester of uh, 2021, we received a PhD student from Australia. Yeah, because of... Mm -hmm. We have international students. There are more than uh, 130 international students uh, in School of Mines of CRMT. And uh, also, uh, now it has been for two years. We have been uh, joining uh, a university from uh, Indonesia. Every year we we hosted an international conference. It has been two years now. We, ha we have a lot of uh, cooperation opportunities uh, to go, and uh, this will be supported, sponsored by our government and uh, also by our university. 
uh, if you um, are interested in this and uh, in the coming months, uh, the one after, in May, we will have uh, an international conference, which is uh, called uh, uh, Environmental Sustainability Develop Sustainable Development, such an uh, uh, international conference. We have been joining, uh, we have been joining with uh, dozens of universities from, from, from the world. So actually not only uh, US, uh, but also from uh, uh, South America, from Chile, uh, from Argentina, uh, also some university from uh, Europe. And uh, last month, uh, last month in, in February, we also joined the uh, Acela Metavo, which is the second largest, uh, uh, second largest uh, steel company in the world is uh, from Luxembourg, from Europe. Uh, they invited us uh, to host uh, an international webinar, just like this, but it was much longer than this. It was of uh, three days. Mm -hmm. In the uh, every year, uh, our central government has uh, a lot of uh, risk, uh, is a lot of international cooperating programs to sponsor such kind of uh, collaborations with our international partners. So if you are interested in this, we can go into source this kind of information. And in the coming years, we can make use, uh, make use of these opportunities to establish more concrete cooperations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mein. Thank you very much, Professor Tsai, for those comprehensive comments. Of course, there's interest uh, from South Africa, so there will be further engagements uh, going forward. Uh, so there is a raised hand uh, from Professor Sam Spearing, and we would like to give him an opportunity to talk. Uh, sorry, yes, I was just... Uh, um, uh, good morning, by the way. It's uh, 4 a.m., <laughs> but I've had two cups of coffee. Um, I just wanted to mention we did try and start some collaboration a couple of years ago on some jointly funded Chinese government and South African government projects, which unfortunately uh, were not uh, sort of granted. And I believe that there's a lot of... Um, very obvious areas um, that we can um, uh, collaborate on, particularly in areas like uh, backfilling, water conservation, and seismicity. And I think the university at CUMT does some amazing groundbreaking work. I mean, if you look at it, the number of academics at CUMT in mining is more than in the whole of the US, Canada and Australia combined. They have some amazing resources. Um, one other thing I'd just like to check is we had a practice session yesterday and Professor Kai gave a talk. I'm not sure now whether he still is, but thanks very much. It was uh, a useful uh, first joint webinar and I hope it's uh, more to come. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Spearing, for, for your inputs yeah, and for the comments. Uh, Professor Tsai, in any event that you will still like to give a short uh, presentation, that will be welcomed. So the team from, uh, from CM, CMT, you are mute. So is the is the possible presentation coming from a Professor Tsai? Hi there, Professor Tim is ready. Mm -hmm. So he, of course he will view the presentation. Yeah. 
it has text several times yesterday. So here we'll give a good presentation. There are something problem that he can't share the screen now. He's trying to solve the problem. Mr. Host, uh, like uh, Professor Tay is experience some kind of a uh, problem with uh, screen sharing. Could you please check like whether you have deprived him of this kind of uh, right to share his screen? We can't share the screen. Okay, so we'll include a Professor Sai as, as a panelist so that he can share the screen, his screen. Yeah. I'll do that. Okay, uh, just one minute. I'm going to double check with him now. Okay, thank you. Sure, sure. Hi, Mr. Host. He's ready now. He's coming. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tsai. You get, you're welcome to share the screen. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Yeah? Thank you for your patience. Okay, can you see my screen, yeah, everybody? Yes, yes you can see your screen, Professor Tsai. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaksana, yeah, for, for such kind introduction for me, yeah. And hello, hello everybody, good morning and good afternoon. And depends on where you are, yeah. I'm Wu Chai yeah, from China University and uh, of Money and Technologies. And uh, I'm currently working in the, in the state key laboratory of coal resources and save money. Uh, so, uh, so thanks for joining join me in this talk. Um, so today, and this talk is going to show some information about Kerber's research progress and the challenges in China. So this talk will include three sections. Uh, as we know, Kerber's or Nockburst uh, is char characterized by rapid and violent release of the elastic, elastic energy due to knock mass failure, a uh, postal service risk to the safety of underground engineering. Uh, it sometimes leads to secondary hazards such as gas outbursts and dust explosions. Here, the term uh, lockburst has been widely accepted in many fields, including coal mine. Um, but the coal burst is a special tense uh, that happened in coal mine. Uh, uh, unlike, uh, unlike 
is a log tunneling. Uh, we label, uh, such as we label a used curb burst. We, we, we label used log burst in the log tunneling as a curb burst. Yeah. So as we can see in the bottom left side, uh, this is a this is a map to show uh, the curb burst months, uh, months in China. Uh, it's about 144, and this data is updated in 2021. Uh, especially the, the largest number of the coal mine, uh, coal burst mines in Sandton Police. And also there are some, some photos to show the coal burst damages underground. Uh, in China, the coal production in 2021 is about, it's around 4.5, three billion tons and there are around 50 coal mines with mining depths over 100 1000 meters in China and uh, especially, especially the maximum mining depths exceeds 1500 meters it is a Swinton coal mine in Shandong province so here is the figures to show uh, uh, the average, average coal depths in different areas in China uh, such as the Sandon province, the average copper depth is about uh, uh, 700 meters. And the Hebei province is about 900 meters. And the whole country in China is about uh, 600. So uh, this is the number of copper months in China. And in 2021, it's around 144. Oh, sorry. And in, in the bottom tab, uh, the table, and the average damage range, the, the, the maximum the damage range, range is about uh, 220 meters in the depths from 1,000, from, from around 1,000. And uh, the average number of the casualties is around six, yeah. Um, okay. The second part is about the coal burst research progress in China. Uh, as summarized, there are four types in, in the process of underground coal mining. Uh, when, when we're developing around the, uh, the fourth, uh, fourth geology areas, in these areas, the geological stress is, is usually very high. So, so in this case, so fault induced uh, coal burst uh, is likely to be to be to be induced. Uh, after the lower panel move forward, um, some pillars, uh, some pillars were usually left between the gulf and the beam mining lower panel. So when uh, wind stress input on the uh, on such pillars, it is. Uh, likely to be failures and even induced uh, uh, pillow induced uh, uh, coal burst. Uh, when the large areas of the coal extract out, especially for the uh, hard sink roof uh, in the large large area of the of the gulf, uh, in this case the, the hard look the hard the sink roof will be easily to induce the coal burst. And the last one is for the fault geologies. When the mining activities are approaching the fault, in this case, so the another kind of uh, fault induced the coal burst is likely to be to be caused. Yeah. Uh, from the stress point, and there are two kinds of uh, stress types. And the first one is uh, impact dynamic stress, uh, as we know. Uh, in the process of uh, underground coal mining, the abutment stress will be formed uh, in front or side of the lower face. Um, so the first uh, uh, type of uh, the impact dynamic stress, in this kind of stress, uh, all stress increment will be generated, will be produced into the, into the coal mass and then, and then uh, puts on the coal mass into the failure and uh, and even induce the coal burst. So another kind of uh, stress 
is a uh, seismic dynamic stress. Uh, for this kind of stress, and the permanent deformations uh, will be accumulated in plastic. Yeah. So when the accumulated uh, strain or deformation or displacements uh, is larger than the bearing abilities, and the core mass is also will be easy a failure and then induce core burst. Core burst. Uh, over the past 70 years in China, uh, many regulations and uh, Chinese uh, and standards has been, have been issued, such as coal mine safety regulations uh, and the associated ex execution specifications, uh, export interpretations, and the rules for lock burst prevention and control in coal mines. And this one is, uh, was executed on August 1st, 2018. Uh, most, most importantly, uh, there are 14 Chinese standards for cobalt liabilities assessment, uh, monitoring and prevention, uh, which includes three for cobalt liabilities, five for monitoring, uh, monitoring techniques and six prevention techniques. And now let's follow all of the regulations. Uh, for the part one is the uh, boosting ability of the core. Um, there are four indicators has been proposed for the comprehensive uh, assessment of uh, co-bursting liabilities. All of them are tested in, uh, can be uh, tested in lab. As similarly, uh, as similar uh, is for the bursting ability of the roof stratus. Uh, in this case, uh, the roof uh, is simplified as a uh, simply supported beam, and uh, these equations can be defined to, to uh, evaluate the co-burst uh, liabilities. And for the third one is uh, another bursting liability of coal rock combination samples. Uh, in, in these standards, uh, the indicators uh, is defined uh, using in the ratio of peak elastic energies to uh, post-peak dissipated energies to uh, comprehensively evaluate the co uh, the boosting liabilities. Uh, liabilities. Uh, for the monitoring techniques, and the first one is uh, micro seismic monitoring. Uh, as we as 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 we know, uh, in the process of the underground coal mines. Uh, the mining induced seismicity events will be observed, and then we can use uh, seismic events, especially in the uh, temporal and spatial domain, uh, can be used this kind of information to, uh, to evaluate the global service, and even and provide some guidance for the, for the mining activities or mining design and uh, some shift uh, productions. So the next one is for the earth sound monitoring. Uh, in, in this technique, um, there are normally four sensors to detect the sounds around the lava face, especially installed or, or head of the lava face. And, this, and this, the sensors can be moved along with, uh, along with uh, uh, advancing of the lava face. Uh, in this techniques, the sound energies and the impulse in cones will be will be connected, and then analysis for the cobalt risk assessment. And the next one is for the cold drill cuttings. So here is a video to show you. Uh, we can drill the borehole and then connect the uh, the cold drill cuttings. And then get the weight. Uh, as a and the fundamental of this technique, the weight of the coal drilling cuttings has a positive relationship with the stress distribution. Also, the power uh, uh, power rest the coal particle size also has a positive relationship with the stress uh, distribution. So here here is. Um, a numerical modeling results to show you 
uh, when the highest, uh, the dwelling the dwelling plastic zones will be larger in the high stress con concentration area. So the next one is a uh, uh, borehole stress monitoring, and this one is a direct monitoring method. Uh, we we will install some pressure sensors into the coal mass, and then um, and then connect the stress values, and then display display in the some uh, in the map, so we can see the stress distribution around the roadway. And then the electromagnetic emission monitoring. And um, it is uh, similar to the earth sound monitoring. Uh, it is used for uh, electromagnetic antenna. As, uh, several antennas will be displayed uh, uh, in the roadway. And, uh, and, and then the electromagnetic energies and the impulse cones will be connected and then analysis for the co-burst uh, risk assessment. So for the co-burst preventions, there, there are sex, uh, sex prevention strategies uh, for the standards. And the first one is uh, water injections and to protect the roadway, so the water injections will be put in uh, around the roadway to waking the coal mass streams and, and, and then protect the supporting systems. Uh, for the second one is a large diameter borehole. And here, here is a, a video to show you. Uh, when the drill drilling in the borehole and then put into the coal cuttings and uh, transfer the streams into the deep, so the function of uh, the di uh, large diameter borehole is uh, is uh, similar to the water injections, and then is the uh, borehole blastings. We can use uh, this method into the coal mass and to weaken weaken the coal mass and transfer the stress into the deep. Uh, for the next one is uh, protective seamaling. Here we saw examples for uh, there, there are three cold scenes. Uh, when we mind the uh, middle, middle cold scenes, and the next two cold scenes will be more safe uh, will be more safe uh, for the uh, for the cobalt preventions. Okay, the next one is a deep hole blasting in roof. And this one is also the similar to the uh, borehole plastic in coal mass. Uh, it is just uh, to uh, to copy the uh, uh, hard roof and then to control uh, the stress around the roadway. And then the roof hydraulic fractures is also the same like the, uh, uh, the deep hole plastics, especially when the deep hole plastics, the, uh, the working effect effective are, are not are limited, we can use the roof hydraulic fractures. So here, here is an example for, uh, for the lower uh, mining activities approaching the fort. So we can use the uh, borehole plastings and the water injections to, uh, to process the uh, fort, and then uh, use the large diameter borehole, borehole plastings, water injections, and borehole slotings uh, for the fort pillars to relieve relieve the high stress and also change the roof structures using using the borehole plastics and the hydraulic fractures. And now let's move on to the uh, cobalt research challenges in China. Uh, as we know, we can get some seismic inf uh, information. We can get uh, uh, spatial distributions and temporal distributions and the energies or or intensities, but how can we use such seismic information for the deep in, in investigations? So here is some examples for uh, for seismic based stress energy index. Uh, here is a uh, here is a case examples. So the first fig is a spatial 
distribution of uh, seismic events. So we can use uh, these seismic events to get the damage parameters. You can understand that you, uh, the more the more seismic events distribute and the more damage degree will be. And then we can use the damage mechanics to, to derive the stress dis distributions. And uh, this indicators has been also validated in the lab. And we, we can also uh, use these uh, methodologies to, to forecasting the co-burst in the temporal uh, domain. And then we can develop some, uh, develop the seismic velocity tomography uh, using the active and passive dual sources integrated. Uh, in these technologies, um, there is a relationship between the velocities and the stress. So they, they have a positive relationship between the uh, velocities and the stress. So here is a lower panel. During the lower panels, we, we conducted uh, the seismic velocity tomography. So we can get the uh, velocities di distributions and the points in the map is, uh, is a seismic events happened in the future or maybe in the next stage. So we can see, and they, they agree well with each other. Yeah. So here is another example. Uh, we, we get the velocity distributions regularly, and then uh, we use the future seismic events located in the map for the validations. So here, so we can see each stage, the seismic events will be located in the high velocity distribution area. Okay. All of the information about mentioned, and there are lots of monitoring data, and uh, especially for different kind of data. So, a remote co-burst monitoring for plant force has been has been established in, in our research group. Uh, in this plant force, all the data from the coal mine are connected and then transformed into my. Uh, into our res uh, research centers through, through the internet. So the multiple parameters based on basic information of stress, seismicity, acoustic emissions, uh, electromagnetic emissions, and uh, at actors are integrated in the prediction model and the region regionally displayed in one GIS map. Yeah, so all the information of monitoring prediction and uh, prevention results uh, are, dis are displayed. And also the mutual feedback is achieved between monitoring and uh, prevention. So let me show you some detail. So here is, uh, uh, here is uh, a monitoring results in one GIS map. So we can see, uh, we can see the Cobalt risk degree for each coal mine from the whole countries, and then we can get into the uh, get into the uh, each coal each coal mine for the spatial details. Yeah, so here is one uh, here is one Chinese coal mine. Yeah, and there there are two lower panels uh, are being mined, so we can get the the risk degree for each other. So there, there are some many modules in this plant for, such as a prediction module and data process module and the roof pressure module and the post three energy module and the preventive, preventative measures modules and the seismicity analysis module. Uh, in, addition, in addition to the uh, monitoring data, uh, we we know there are also another uh, another information status such as the phenomenal phenomenological data and the theoretical or empirical knowledge data or numerical modeling data. So all of the data we should be put together and uh, 
and for the comprehensive analysis. So we develop a software to 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 integrate all of the information and uh, and then get get the final results. So here is some examples for uh, for 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 Coleman. So here is um, here is um, the co-birth risk degree for the uh, distributions of the uh, lower palomalins. So we can see the, the high values of the risk degree is, um, is always ahead of the lower phase and also on the uh, geological structures. So here, here is another example. So we get the, we get the uh, risk map and uh, the points is, uh, is a seismic events happened in the next stage. Also, here is a log burst events located in this high risk area. Um, as we know in, in, China, in Chinese coal mines, the micro seismic uh, system, monitoring systems, there are some, some questions or maybe some challenges for the monitoring. The first one is uh, the seismic stations geometry always forms like a plane in underground coal panel. So uh, which will be res result in that the location area can hardly be controlled, especially in vertical directions. So we need to develop a, a kind of underground and uh, underground integrated micro seismic monitoring systems. Uh, to control the seismic events in vertical directions. And the, six, the second challenge is uh, uh, currently the micro seismic monitoring systems used in Chinese coal mines is always uh, single component sensors, normally uh, deployed in coal mines. So uh, as a result, the, in this case, the large amounts of information for seismic source parameters has been missed. So uh, in, in this developed micro seismic monitoring systems, we should use uh, three components sensors underground and uh, integrate with, uh, with uh, sensors along with the uh, ground, maybe the surface. And the last one is uh, in recent years, maybe just in recent two years, and there is um, a new technologies uh, just uh, move from the petroleum. It's a ground hydraulic fracturing using L-shaped horizontal wheel to prevent corpus induced by hard and zinc roof structures. So here is, um, uh, here is a map to show the information. So we can we use the L-shaped horizontal wheels and then get some uh, hydraulic fracturing and networks and to to control the hard and the sink roof and uh, weaken the roof structures and then to control the the stress move move into the mining mining surface mining mining locking, sorry a lower mining phase yeah. So here is uh, examples in, in a Chinese coal mine, and there are six there are six stages for the hydraulic fractures, and we get some the mining induced seismicity events. So we can see uh, the mining induced seismicity has a, a large influence range uh, around the uh, roof structures. But um, in the move forward, we can uh, we are going to validate uh, this kind of strategies can be controlled uh, the cobalt preventions uh, because this this lower panels have not yet been mined. Maybe will be mined in the uh, in the next year. So okay, uh, the conclusions. Uh, Cobalt has become one of the common safety issues in underground coal mining in China, 
and its monitoring, forecasting, and prevention is an important component in the safety management. And the second one, the COBOS research in China has been forwarded in, in a rich progress, which includes 21 clause in common safety regulations and 14 Chinese standards for COBOS reliability assessment, monitoring, and uh, prevention. And finally, the COBOS research challenges in China are also being moved forward, such as the seismic based methods for COBOS forecasting active and passive dual source integrated seismic velocity tomography and uh, a remote cobalt monitoring platform and the physics based on the data driving assessment model and uh, underground ground integrated micro seismic monitoring systems and finally the ground hydraulic fracturing using l-shaped horizontal well to prevent cobalt induced by hard and sink roof structures. So that's all my presentation. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Atsai, for sharing call best research progress and challenges in China. It was quite, the presentation was quite interesting and this important research, not just for China, but for other territories globally. In the best interest of time, we will unfortunately not be taking any questions as we have overrun our schedule. But at this point, I would like to give a big thanks uh, to all the speakers, uh, to Professor Ma, to Professor Tsai, and of course to Professor Lindsay in, in, in her absentia. So again, I would like to thank uh, the team from uh, the CUMT, led again by Professor Ma, Professor Tsai, and Mr. Wang. Thank you very much for exchanging knowledge with, with, our, with, with South Africa. I hope that uh, there will be more of such exchanges in the future and will build on this collaboration as well beyond maybe only the webinars. It will be nice one day that your team uh, visits South Africa and vice versa that our team here from South Africa visits uh, China. So it's a big thank you. It's, uh, it's from, 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 from my side. And of course, I would also like to thank uh, the SAIM for affording us the platform uh, that now we're using for this uh, particular webinar. So it's a big thanks to the team uh, from, Sa from the SAIM and that the team is led by Ms. Camilla Jardin, who is the head of conferencing at the SAIM. And of course, I would also like to give a big thanks to Professor Anthony uh, Sperrin also for making these collaborations possible between the CU, MT and the SAIM in South Africa. And uh, lastly, but not least, of course, all the part uh, most of the participants, I've seen that they've remained. It's a big thanks to all the participants from all over the world. And uh, that concludes this webinar. A big thank you. Thank you. Thank you.